the most powerful enemies. Goku, whatever you've got planned, now's the time to spring it. The strongest heroes. Kai! The biggest fights. I'm Naruto Uzumaki, don't forget it! All come together in one place. Hulu is the home to Naruto Shippuden, Bleach Thousand Year Blood War, Dragon Ball Z Kai, and more of your favorite anime. Find your anime on Hulu's Animayhem, your anime destination. Welcome to Dynamic Duos, the podcast from CBR where two titans from pop culture get a chance to interview each other for a change. I'm Tiffany Crivelli. Today's episode features the mega-talented duo Patton Oswalt and Jordan Bloom, the waggish minds behind the Hulu series MODOK and the Marvel series MODOK Head Games. Patton is known for his stand-up comedy specials and his extensive acting and voice work, and Jordan from his skillful writing on fan-favorite shows like Community and American Dad. Patton and Jordan chat all about their original comic book miniseries Minor Threats, published by Dark Horse Comics, and even tease the sequel series The Alternates, written by Tim Seeley and beginning this September. All right, let's get right into this fantastic episode of Dynamic Duos. Hey, Patton, I'm doing well. Uh, I thought we might do something really different than when we normally hang out and actually talk about comic books. What? Wait just a minute. change it up. Just a uh, what? You're, just, you're throwing us into such a hard left turn here. We're going to go right into the ravine. <laughs> Um, well, I feel like I know a lot about the comics we like now and this kind of stuff, but I would love to kind of go back a little, you know, further into our past. And I was curious, kind of what was your gateway into comics, whether it was an issue, a person, a store, or even like a show or something like that, that kind of brought you into the world? Well, there's two answers to that, because one was when I was super little, Comics were just in the atmosphere. It was Spider-Man. It was Superman. It was bright Saturday morning cartoons. They just were kind of the idea of superheroes. Even before <clears throat> they were comics, the idea of people with powers was everywhere. And But then it wasn't until my senior year of high school when I, because at that point, I knew all the tropes without really collecting or reading the comics. And then when I got to senior year of high school, that's when I first picked up uh, Frank Miller's uh, The Dark Knight Returns and really just spun my head around that, oh, wait, you can tell actual human stories here with depth and complexity. So it was just one, it was like they tenderized me and then they threw me into the oven. That That's kind of <laughs> how that happened. What, what about you? Was, was it the same kind of idea or were you were you a true believer from the get go? Yeah. Well, it was funny. My my father uh, is an immigrant, and he learned to read English from comics. Oh. So that was they were kind of there, you know. When I was even in a high chair, mm. they were just around. Uh, he was buying them for me, and and the same thing though. There was that perfect storm of action figures like superpowers and secret wars that I was buying and then buying the comics. I don't remember if I got the secret wars comic first or the toys first, but they were just like they existed, <laughs> like you said. Um, and the same thing, my, my mom would take me to the library and I would just beeline it for the comic rack. So they were they were kind of always there. Um, but I had a, a funny thing because I think being a little younger than you, I do remember buying the Killing Joke and my, <laughs> I don't know, it's been like six or something <laughs> or seven. Wait, what? I'm trying to think. Yeah, because uh, it was like, oh, a Batman story with a cool cover of the Joker. And then my mom reading oh, like a Time no. magazine that was – a little bit like a, a seduction of the innocent thing. Like, do you know what your kids are reading? And she had to go through and kind of remove some of those comics from my collection. And then I was giving them back later. Wow. Uh, so I didn't read Dark Knight. Soul. Same thing, probably high school or college, because I think some of those comics were <laughs> removed early on in my collection. Was there a comic that you remember, like a comic book, where the first time that you sort of understood that these characters were part of a big, wider narrative that could kind of like collide in, into each other. And, and, oh, it's not just I'm picking up this issue. Stuff that's happening in this issue can affect what happens in a different issue that I pick up. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely, like I said, like Secret Wars was that big first crossover. Mm -hmm. But I, I remember the one where it was like I'm in and I have to show up every Wednesday and I'm going to start a pull box was the Executioner song. It was the big 90s X-Men crossover that like timed perfectly with the cartoon and it had X-Force meeting X-Factor for the first time, like all these kinds of ones. And Cable shot Xavier. And it was one of those, they, they just, it was like a 16-part crossover and it came with trading cards. 
and everyone left with, on a cliffhanger and you had to be reading every X-Men book. And it was that moment of like these tie so well together and I have to know what happens next. So that was the beginning of my my pull box days, I think. What about for you? Hang on. They they named a, a, a comic book arc after the Gary Gilmore, the, the, the Norman Mailer book about the, the execution of Gary Gilmore. <laughs> well, to be fair, they, it was executioners. It was ex cash. So, you know, they put their spin on it. Sure. <laughs> sure. I mean, mine was, it was weird. It, it was, again, it was all part. Of, I remember reading a werewolf by night. Cause I just like, Oh, it's a werewolf fighting. I didn't, you know, but then, Spider-Man shows up and then someone, there's this villain that sees the fight going on and they go, oh, that's Spider-Man. He's a New York superhero. Like there are people that understand that there's a bigger world happening. Um, it was where mm -hmm. Spider-Man and Werewolf, I think, teamed up to fight the Tattered Demalion, who was, a, was like <laughs> a homeless guy, but he's a super, what? And then I started noticing that in other, like in Mysterious Island, oh, Captain Nemo shows up or in Huckleberry Finn at the end of it, oh, Tom Sawyer shows up. Like they're all connected in these universes where they can kind of run into each other. I just, I love stuff like that. Oh yeah. I mean, that's, I think it's discovering that there's this narrative, right? That that's 60 plus years old now, 70 probably, yeah. you know, where you can go back and you can fill in these holes and you can see how these characters first met or, you know, uh, for me, X-Men was that it was, getting a handful of issues in the eighties and none of it making sense, but that being the enticing thing, right. Of like, well, it's up to you to figure out, you know, what the siege perilous is and why Psylocke suddenly a ninja, and, wow, yeah. you know, and, all, and I loved that task, right. Of like, I'm going to fill in these holes. I'm going to do the research. I'm going to, yeah. you know, get the back issue, yeah. you know, wait a minute. Didn't Spider-Man debut in 1963? Yeah. So this is the 60th anniversary of him. I think so. I think a lot of them are celebrating that, right? Yeah, this year, X-Men 2. I think that was, I mean, that was the year. Uh, yeah. 62, 63. 63 where the, where the big ones the, came out. Yeah, so. they were the big ones. And it's insane that those stories are still building on themselves. Yeah. You know? uh, and then, so in, and, uh, within our lifetime, if we live to 2041, which unfortunately looks like we will, so we'll see the 100th anniversary of Captain America. That's crazy. That'll happen. And if we can somehow, if I can live to age 96, I think you're younger than me. If I can make it to 96, I'll see the 100th anniversary of Spider-Man. God, that's so wild. Well, I mean, thank God only certain characters are kind of tied to events. Like, I think even the Punisher, right, recently they moved him to the Gulf War. Like, they, they, they're untethering. But, oh, but they Captain always America, do that. Least, but Captain America, you can always have the World War II thing because you got the ice thing that can, can <laughs> slide the scale. Freeze him, you know. throw him out later. Boom. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. All right. Well, let's talk a little bit about kind of the process of writing comics. Obviously, we came up as fans. You know, now that we've we've written a bunch together, what do you feel like defines that job of a comic writer? Uh, you know, especially in relation to you know, writing for Scott Hepburn, our artist on Minor Threats. Yeah, I mean, for me, one of the biggest things I had to learn was to get over all my anxiety about, to quote Harold Bloom, the anxiety of influence. You know, I, I read a lot of comics. I am wowed by a lot of stuff that happens in comics. And um, as much as I'm inspired by it, and as much as I'm like, that's what comics should do, then when it's time for you to sit down in front of that blank page, and you have everything in your head that's gone before and you want to top it and not feel like you're being derivative or stealing from it like that get that can really sometimes having a, a a deep and wide comic knowledge can be a hindrance when you start writing because you're so aware of what's happened beforehand absolutely i feel like that was a concern especially with minor threats and i felt like the thing that opened it up for us was finding a perspective you know from these these low level villains and also a you know, subgenre of this being this kind of uh, Coen Brothers esque, you know, comedic noir. Yes. Uh, that suddenly it it freed us, I think, from traditional stories. Or we've seen the Batman perspective of this, but these are the low level villains we've never seen there. Things. So I think that to me was the key to unlocking it. Is you know, yes, let's filter in all these years of of history of comics, but what's the new you know point of view or take? that we've never seen that suddenly makes it feel fresh. And I felt like once we found that it was, it was kind of, it opened up the book for us. Definitely. Yeah. Um, um, but also like after we, another big thing for me was 
after we turned in our initial pages and saw what Scott was drawing, I think that changed our writing. I think that when we saw the world, obviously we saw the world in our heads, but he added angles and elements and dimensions to it that weren't there. And then that frees you up to do even to, oh, I can actually go further because he just went further. Absolutely. And it was kind of like almost throwing a challenge to him that he welcomed, which is like, give me a page that uses the medium in a way we haven't seen before or feels new and fresh. Yes. And I think once he did that first page, uh, I believe it was in the first issue where we see one of the characters been, has been beat up by uh, the insomniac and he's on a table laid out. And instead of doing flashbacks or, you know, what could have been a three page scene, it's all on a splash page where these insets of the moments of impact of yeah. how, you know, uh, what the, what the insomniac did to him. And I felt like that was one where Scott came back with all these, ideas and it was like ooh that's a really cool way to a, a form of storytelling you could only do in comics how do we try and do something like that each issue and kind of mm -hmm. throw that challenge to Scott and challenge ourselves to to kind of write towards that as opposed to maybe our instincts of doing a dialogue scene or you know a longer kind of uh, action scene that would be more traditional to TV and movies how do we use comics? I think that was that was a key moment. Yeah, you know? what's key to me is the less dialogue, the better. I mean, I always go back to those early Mike Mignola Hellboy scripts where he's he's doing massive lore and background, but with very very little dialogue. It's all done through action and through visuals, um, and you have this character that doesn't you know Hellboy doesn't speak that much, so it really. And he undercuts the, the, the characters that occasionally a character shows up that does monologue and he just undercuts that. So it's like, what is, what can we do about this right now? So I love, I just love how can we do this with more visuals and less dialogue? Yeah. I feel like that became a part of our outlining almost where it was like, what are the tent pole visuals that we're building towards yeah. within the issue? Yeah. And, uh, you know, let's build the scenes around those, but let's know that that's anchoring it. And, you know, it's, it's really starting to think, at visuals first and then the dialogue is such a second part of it you know when you go in to, to write it yeah. so look we've been working together for a while and i guess what is it about our collaborative process i think that lends itself so well to comics like what is it that we talked about our histories with comics you know as well but i feel like we're also pulling a lot from these references i think you have a deep reference of of noir i mean do you want to talk a little bit about that how much we watched yeah you know trailers and stuff <laughs> In the vibe of the, of the book. Well, you know, we, it, it's interesting how our backgrounds in comics kind of inform how we write. I had that it was just a thing that was hanging in the air for me. So I tend to have way more ideas than we know what to do with. I'm, I'm, I'm almost like lethally too open to every single, I want to follow every goddamn character. And you very early on understood the structure of these things, even with something as massive as Secret Wars, there's a lattice work and there's an organizational principle behind it. So uh, it really works in that I'm talking about vague, um, not just vague ideas, but way too detailed ideas or even worse. I just have a mood for this man. I have this. It has to feel like this. And then you're able to translate it into dialogue, plot, and character, you know, to, to keep the atmosphere of the world there. So I think those two things together. And yes, I have a massive background in film noir, in every age of film noir, in the, you know, the, the golden age of the 40s. And then that weird suppressed 1950s where, you know, stuff could not have been more clamped down. But then you had people like Douglas Sirk and Sam Fuller smuggling stuff in. You didn't realize they were doing it. And then in the 60s, it was all, you know, noir was almost dead at that point, but you had these weird outliers like Blast of Silence. And then the silver age of noir is the early 70s when America could not have been more paranoid. And they were right for Parallax View, Chinatown, all of this, like the everything is three days of the Condor. Uh, and then uh, 80s, it was way more stylish. And then, of course, 90s, you had the second wave of movie brats that were, back in the 90s, weirdly enough, they were remaking a lot of movies from the 40s. Uh, a Kiss Before Dying, After Dark, My Sweet, uh, Criss Cross, and stuff like that. They were doing newer versions of it. So, you know, you, I just see how it permeates everything. I think that's what's so fun is, again, when you mesh genres together, superhero noir. And then I feel like we also threw a little kind of grindhouse in there because we wanted this to have that 70s, mm -hmm. 80s kind of 
warriors uh assault uh, you know on precinct you know like carpenter vibes uh that that cuz we wanted it to feel i think like there was this bronze age silver age that was dying yeah. and we were being dragged into the frank miller alan moore Kind yeah, of darker. And, and in the uh, 80s, 80s, a lot of times, just by accident, some of these, those, like you were saying, that the grindhouse low budget filmmakers ended up making these incredible documents of their time that people didn't realize. Like, like if you go watch Basket Case, Frank Henelotter's Basket Case, yes, it's a weird sex monster movie. It's also the only time on film that someone captured just how horrifying New York was in the early 80s in right. the Lower East Side and in like beyond Times Square, because nobody was filming down there, you know? So like that kind of, yeah. that sort of, because they couldn't have permits, a lot of these sleazy direct to video, and we even do a little, there's a nod to that coming up, that whole great um, Andy Sedaris, just sleazy direct to video thing. Um, they would end up accidentally going, oh, that's, this is actually valuable now. Because this is the only guy that turned mm. the camera on in this neighborhood. <laughs> there's a, there's a really that. weird, I was watching all this 80s horror on Criterion, and there's a movie called Wolfen with Albert Finney it was, and, and Gregory Hines, and it's kind of a werewolf movie and kind of not. It's very, But they, it's early 80s, and they shot in areas of New York that had been so gentrified, and they got stuff on film where you, you just want to watch the movie just to see these neighborhoods where you're like, the crew must have been terrified filming here. There's no facilities, there's no police, nothing is working, and they were still down there filming. Holy shit. That's what I was thinking. If you're if you're doing a show like The Deuce on HBO Max, you watch Basket Case for production design. Absol- for, oh, you know, there's like, no way like, there's like, no way they didn't watch Basket Case for there's no <laughs> way they didn't watch that movie. Well I'll steer us back to comics a little bit. Yeah, um, sorry. You, no, it's okay. This is exactly what it's like yeah, yeah. hanging out with us. We, we'll yeah. go down the oh, deepest rabbit oh, holes. Oh, it stuff is rabbit on. holes. Yeah. <laughs> um do you have like a fanboy story of meeting a creative that inspired you? Is there an artist, a writer, like somewhere where you were just like, I finally got to have five minutes with this person that kind of sent me down yeah. this, this route of, of comics? Life. Well, I mean, I, I'm not saying this to brag, but like I've become friends with Neil Gaiman. Um, I'm friends with Mark Wade. You know, I'm friends with people that had an impact on me. I became friends near the end of his life with Harlan Ellison. And Harlan Ellison was, you know, he was kind of looking at comics in a deconstructivist way before even Alan Moore and Frank Miller thought about it. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. there was that. Um, so and getting to see, it was really interesting is getting to see, Harlan Ellison said something really interesting. He goes, anyone can become a writer. It's almost impossible to stay a writer. That's what becomes hard. Mm-hmm. And I got to see really great examples, especially with Neil, especially with Harlan, like how do you sustain a life and a career in writing so it, just by how they would do things and how they would conduct themselves. And that would, that to me was more valuable than getting to like gush and go, Oh my God, the beast that shot in love with the heart of the world was the coolest bug. You know, like it was more like watching them in their day to day stuff. was fast. Absolutely. How about uh, you? Who, do, think, who was the one that you met where you were like, bah, 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 bah. well, mine, uh, the be- uh, to me, the, the greatest moment for me was at a Comic Con party. Uh, I got to meet Grant Morrison, who's probably the most influential Holy writer on on all shit. of my work in any medium. Yeah, you know. Uh, uh, and he, by the way, really quickly, Grant Morrison was the guy who really went through the doors that Alan Moore, Frank Miller, and Neil Gaiman opened up. He's the guy that, uh, more than anyone else, took advantage of them laying on the barbed wire to really go to town. Sorry, just had to say that. Yeah. Well, I feel like they did a great job of taking those what you would you know the mature reader elements but marrying it with the silliness of of 60s you know or 40s 50s 60s comics mm-hmm. that I love and I think that's a huge influence especially on minor threats is that we wanted to do a deconstructionist story but not a mean spirited one yes. I think Grant Morrison is great at deconstruction that celebrates the fun history of comics as opposed yes. to you know, taking it down. Um, he clearly but, loved uh, it. Yeah, I met them at a oh, big time, and I met them at a, a party. You know, one of those Comic Con parties, and they were a huge fan of uh, Community, uh, which I had worked oh. on. So that was kind of my way to start talking. And then, but for me, it was just let's talk about DC. Let's talk about DC. And I got 15 minutes of Grant Morrison breaking down. I think he was. They were writing Wonder Woman at the time, breaking down the character 
as a concept and it was incredible. And it was one of those points where you, you meet someone and you can feel the conversation winding down a little bit, but you could, you could easily continue it. Or I decided to just end it and walk away with the most perfect 15 minutes of meeting my hero, as opposed to drawing it out and making it awkward or whatever, it going in a different direction. It was like, I'm going to savor this 15 minutes and, and just thank them and walk you away. You knew when to walk away from the blackjack table. <laughs> Exactly. Wow. And, exactly. What, and I, I'm sorry. Again, what was he deconstructing so perfectly? Wonder Woman. Oh. Just as a concept, as a character, the history, how it influences how she's written now. It was just, uh, it was everything you wanted. It was like a, 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 you know, taking like a grad class at Wonder Woman. And again, I'm sure it was, it was a, it was an explanation that still embraced how much he loved the character. Like it, it wasn't this, mm-hmm. ah, this is bullshit. They should do this, 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 and this, you know? No, it was like, this is why she has to have a kangaroo sidekick. <laughs> it was like, yes, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so that was, that was amazing. Wow. Um, let's see. Oh, let's talk a little bit. Um, so we obviously are trying to, you know, Mind Effects is our own comic, uh, we, which we publish with Dark Horse, creator owned. So uh, we work very closely with them, but also it's up to us to kind of get new readers, you know? Yeah. And I want to talk a little bit about, you know, marketing comics and concepts. And, you know, we've done signings and things like what have we've tried to, to kind of push things outside the box. Do you want to talk a little bit about like how to reach new readers, I guess, or, or new creative ways? To yeah. Play? I mean, there's a lot of, I mean, yeah, we should, we should uh, loop in Kyle Higgins on this one because he's the current master. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you have to explore other, uh, you know, we now have, I forgot who said this, but we've got a million streaming channels. We've got video games. We've got Twitch streams. We've still got books and music and films, but everyone still has the same 90 minutes. So how do you uh, land uh, something in, in, a, in a world where there are a million other just as good, if not better options? And so I think one of the things you do is you accept that there are better things out there and you let that inspire you rather than make you resentful when uh, I think on I, Early on, a few years ago, I was like, what, I got to do TikTok stuff? It's like, these are just more venues for you to get to be creative. You know, find a creative way to do it. So, you know, especially getting to have dialogue with your readers and as issues come out, go, oh, hey, look for this little thing that we put there. Look for this panel. Scott posts early artwork and pages. We, t- You know, uh, you can tease stuff. So, yeah, for, for me, just using Twitter, using Instagram, using my website um, and going on podcasts and, and talking to people about it. Other people that, you know, there are people that are interested in, in comics and in the creative process. And by the way, it doesn't have to be like, Oh, so you're just going to talk to other writers. No, there are people I'm, I'm very much a film fan and I love listening to commentary on DVDs. It doesn't mean, you know what I mean? Like I just, I love the process. It's it, it, in every aspect of it enchants me. So be enchanting. You know, be enchanted with the process. Well, I feel like we were really inspired. You mentioned our friend Kyle Higgins, uh, another writer friends with David Dusmalchi, and we're trying to have these events. You know, we've done a lot of signings yeah. uh, at, you know, stores and stuff, but we really wanted to do something different. And I think give comics a little more of like, uh, I hate calling it this, but like Hollywood party, Hollywood premiere, you know, kind of yeah. vibe. So we worked very closely with this incredible store um, in Los Angeles called Revenge Oh my God. That um, they are uh, production designers as well as comic store owners. And I feel like they are moving to kind of become the space that the Nerdist once was yep. in Los Angeles, yes, where it's they are. Not just a comic store, it's a performance space. So they teamed up with us to do this amazing um, release party for, for the first Minor Threats graphic novel out uh, July 12th. Uh, and we um, we were able to have you utilizing you know your relationships with our standups. You performed a set, uh, Ron Funches, uh, Brian Posehn, and then we uh, had a band play, and they had made this performance space mm. that had all this minor threat stuff. It was incredible, and it was I think again it was inviting people in who maybe came for the band or came for the com- for the comedians, and then picked up the comic as well. Yeah. And it was kind of a way to say like this is. You know, this is an art form like these other ones that are exciting and interesting. And, and here's a way to kind of make it a little more of a party than just come to the signing at the store. Uh, obviously, 
that's easier said than done when you have the resources of Revenge of, but yes. it was a way to think outside of it. And I think we saw Kyle do that as well. He had a kind of a party at that Star Wars bar yeah. um, uh, in Hollywood. So just, you know, trying to, you know, treat uh, comic releases uh, what they are, which would be big events. I thought was really fun. Yeah, I'd love to, um, for some future stuff, get hire five actors to cosplay our main characters at some kind of event, like a party and yes. get pictures of that. We'll, we'll, that. That's back down the line. But I, again, I still have, I have other ideas. Trust me. I love that. We should absolutely yeah, do yeah, that. Yeah. Let's see. Um, okay. So working, obviously we, you and I have worked in television movies and, and you obviously are uh, a huge stand up. What, what do you feel like working comics compares to, to other creative work? Like, how is it different? How is it similar? Well, one way that I didn't realize comics were so similar to screenwriting is your artist is your director of photography, where I always thought you've got to, in this panel, there is this, this. You can describe an action that takes place over a page, and your artist, he or she or they will figure out, I know the exact, the, the, the more freedom that we've given Scott to kind of map out and, uh, you know, art design uh, and and film these pages, the, the more startling stuff he's given us. Um, so there is that. But there is also, you know, you do have to be, I think, way more descriptive than in a TV or film script. You really have to have an idea, if, especially if you want to be really specific. And this has to look a certain way, especially if it feeds into the plot later. You better be really, really specific early on about what that's going to feel like. Absolutely. I also feel like when you're writing a TV or film script, you're you know, you're writing something in a very kind of strict style and and um, and format, and it's designed that anyone you know should be able to pick it up, and and you know you're gonna have all these department heads and actors and all these people who have to kind of go through this thing. Whereas a comic script is just a letter to your artist. Yeah, it's very informal. It's you know you can you can put in reference, you can speak directly to them, you know, or to your your uh, colorist or to your letterer, and I think. That's a really fun way to think of it is like the only person who really needs to understand this and be excited about this is is your your artist, yeah. your team. So I think you can kind of throw out the formalities of, of screenwriting and just make something very personal. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Towards them. Yeah, I love it. It, it. It's amazing. It's such a cool process. Let's talk a little bit about obviously we talked about collaborating with each other mm -hmm. and with Scott, but – we have a book coming out, The Alternates, which yep. is the first spinoff in the Minor Threats uh, universe. Do you want to talk about how that book came together and uh, talk about Tim and Chris yeah. and Tess and um, everyone else working on it? Again, we were not we were not looking for this to happen. We were not we weren't prepared for it. Uh, a friend of ours, mutual friend Tim Seeley, also a, an amazing comic book writer and artist. His series over at Image right now, uh, Local Hero is Local Man is brilliant and is such a Incredible. love letter to maybe one of the worst periods in, in modern comics, which is the '90s. And he <laughs> has wrung out some genuinely beautiful humanity from it and, and among others uh, he has so many great books but he proposed an idea set within the world of minor threats but a a, a side you know, a whole side story about another aspect of this world that we hadn't explored in the first minor threats and it's friggin brilliant because it really takes in all the vertigo stuff of the late 80s early 90s and what that would what a real world version of what that would feel like to comic characters who go through that adulting deconstructiveness it's brilliant and it just he he pitched it to us and we immediately loved it and we took it to dark horse they went hell yeah and now we have the first uh minor threat sequel yeah and it was really fun you know like pat was saying the 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 series is about a group of kind of bronze age loser heroes who go over into an alternate reality where they become these vertigo yeah deconstructed mature reader yep. characters and then come back to our uh more two-dimensional superhero world and become a support group because they have a hard time adapting back to their lives so one of the fun things we wanted to do was to have two very different looks for for the book so we have chris christopher mitten who's doing the main pencils which is set in the, the main minor threats world um and they're kind of uh, purposely a little grungier, a little dirtier. Mm -hmm. And then Tess Fowler, uh, who paints in watercolors, is doing oh my God. this kind of, uh, you know, four-dimensional uh, vertigo world. And and we really wanted the two 
art styles to almost clash uh, yeah. in a really fun way. And um, that's been, again, something you can only do in comics mm-hmm. is to you know, hit different art styles against each other for, for, and juxtapose them for, for story and, purposes. And especially in terms of where the, the art style itself is a personality. And you can see that fighting, the two personalities fighting. It, it, it's a wordless fight, but it's very, very human. Absolutely. So we're very excited about that book. You can pre-order that now um before we sign off is there anything else you wanted to to comment on on the world of comics or uh um well you know it, it, how can i put this i was thinking about this the other day it feels like we're hitting another inflection point another oversaturation point but not with and i think people are doing this the wrong way we're hitting an we're hitting an oversaturation point on nostalgia but not necessarily on mm-hmm. comics because within the world of comics there are such incredibly original visions being done. I, I already mentioned Local Man. There's a, a thing over at Ahoy Comics called My Bad. Um, just amazing stories being told. But what makes it to the screen, what makes it to mass culture is often uh, just kind of soggy nostalgia. And I think that people are butting their heads against nostalgia and we're weirdly ripe for a completely original direction in the way that comic books and comic book heroes are portrayed either on television or in films. Uh, so, so I'm almost like, I'm glad that we've hit the nostalgia wall and crash right now. Cause it'll be, it'll be really interesting to see what gets rebuilt out of the wreckage. Well, I think the things that land now, right. Are the new voices, the spider versus yes. the boys, you know, things that, that have a new spin or a new take on this material. I don't think you can just do a traditional, superhero story origin you know yeah. being middle and then fight the bad guy in the third act it's over i think people absolutely are clamoring for these kinds of stories but we've gotten so much you really have to have something unique and different to tell yeah and that's the stuff that breaks through so i'm i like that trend yeah and i don't think every superhero story uh needs to be adapted or right. you know we need to just keep doing the same stuff over again yeah, what um, about so? And what so, about you? What is what is big for you in comics, or what are you what are you noticing right now? Um, I'm loving stuff that is smaller stories. Mm-hmm. You know, um, like uh, Mark Wade is doing that uh, DC book. Um, it's not the Brave and the Bold. What's the one is he doing? World's Finest. Oh yeah, where the, it doesn't matter what the continuity is. It's just a great showcase for exactly. hey, DC has a million characters that are just as good as Batman, and here yeah. they are, and and look at this rich world that we can tap into. And the same thing, I am reading The Brave and the Bold, which are just these short stories where let's get great talent to just, again, showcase these characters. So I've been really having a lot of fun with DC stuff, you know, Local Man and, and a bunch of other kind of smaller books I'm, I'm enjoying as well. DC is doing um, really interesting, you were talking about non-continuity. DC is doing some really fascinating non-continuity stuff with their black label. Um, just like, genuinely brilliant stuff and they um i don't know if you're if you're reading um uh peacemaker tries hard oh, so are you reading that well they just brought that oh yeah i'm jealous of every issue i read uh it's one of the funniest books it is really funny and in the latest one and i won't spoil it kyle starks brought back one of the worst dc heroes of all time and kind of redeemed him in a beautiful way the only other time i've seen him done James Robinson had him pop up in a run on San and on Starman, and it was also done in a really, really interesting human way. And I'll, I don't know if you've read issue three yet. I read it yesterday, and it was, I was so you'll be very, very happy. Like a maligned, a right by the way, a rightfully maligned DC hero that he kind of it's really beautiful. That's my bread and butter. Yeah. If I can use this uh, outlet for anything, it's to invite. Kyle starts to please come play in the Minor Threats universe with us. Kyle, He's one of my favorite Carte writers. Blanche, we love you, Kyle. Oh, my God, we love you so much. And I especially – look, I thought I couldn't love you anymore until I read the third issue of Peacemaker Tries Hard when I saw what you did. <laughs> oh, my God. I want to say thank you to Patton and Jordan for this great episode. Minor Threats Volume 1 is on sale now, and you can pick up the alternates number one on September 13th at your local comic shop or wherever comics are sold online. If you have a moment, please rate and review this show and share it with a friend. As always, thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time on Dynamic Duos. Dynamic Duos.